bread. What is it? I don't know, that's not my job to explain to you. My job is to talk about Breadwinners, a cartoon on Nickelodeon that lasted for two seasons about two best friend anthropomorphic ducks whose job it is is to deliver bread with their flying van on their planet of Pangea. That name is brilliant. It was bright and colorful and full of wacky adventures, but despite strong viewership at the start, would be scorned with negative reviews going after the look of the show, lack of plot lines that were deeper than surface level, and humor akin to the lowest form of it. From a strong premiere to a force to the side ending on the dreaded Nicktoon Network graveyard. Today we are going to take a look at the rise and sad fall of breadwinners. We're gonna need a bigger lily pad. Oh boy, we got a big one! I'm gonna miss those crazy baps. February 17th, 2014. Breadwinners would premiere on Nickelodeon to about 2.8 million viewers. Originally started off as a standalone short shown off at a New York City bar, the show made a splash on the network, hitting a solid ranking within a surprising older teen to young adult demographic. And as the months went on, the show would rank high with kids preteen and under, still bringing in a solid 1.7 million views to the show. Everything on the surface here looked pretty great. Strong viewer numbers, a spread in the demographic to have a wide range of fans, the show seemed to be on a good path to success. By May of 2014, the show was already renewed for a second season. All good signs. And it all started out with a wish and a dream and a two-month Adobe Flash made short. Back in 2010, an animated sketch show Mad, based off of Mad Magazine, was new to Cartoon Network. Two people that worked on that show Steve Borst, one of the show's writers, and Gary Doodles DiRaphael, an animator turned lead animator for the show, got together on their own time at Gary's apartment with a fun concept of what Breadwinners is and spent two months working on a short for it that would both be shown off at the Midsummer Night Tunes Film Festival at a bar in New York City, along with uploading the short onto YouTube which would get some attention and a bunch of eyes on it. In its first week on YouTube, it racked in around 15,000 views, as Borst noted that it just took on a life of its own. But knowing that they wanted more from Breadwinners as they had more stories to tell about these bread-selling ducks, the viewers of the short wanted more as well. On a whim, they sent their short to Nickelodeon, not in hopes that it was a surefire thing that would get their attention, but sometimes stranger things have happened and what's the harm in trying, right? To both of their surprise, Nickelodeon reached back out to them interested in the property. Something so out of the blue and realm of actual thought that Gary was very confused by this offer and originally thought that it was just spam. It couldn't be real, could it? Spoiler alert, it was real. A handful of months later, and the creators of the short were both hired to take what they had with their original short and build it into a full-on series for Nickelodeon. 20 episodes were ordered, and it even premiered five days ahead of its scheduled premiere set for February 22nd, 2014, on the 17th for a sneak beak preview to generate hype for this new series. The first season, viewership-wise, was great, bringing a healthy one to two million viewers before taking tapering off a bit as the season would play out for the rest of the year and into 2015. The critical reviews of the show, however, were not kind to it. But despite this, the series would be renewed for a second season with another 20 episodes. While the rise of the show was strong, there is a reason that this video is titled Rise and Fall. But before we get into all of that, we need to take a look at the show in general to grasp what it truly was. We definitely have a problem here. Breadwinners up next. We delivered all the bread. All the bread. Breadwinners follows two duck best friends, Sway Sway and Badoos. Sway Sway, voiced by Robbie Damon, actually comes from a long line of family members who were bread delivery ducks making him perfect and destined for the job. Sure, let's go with that. Because you'll see in the show that his antics with Badoos would tell a different story, but I digress. He is the one who pilots their rocket-powered flying van. Badoos, voiced by Eric Baza, serves as the duo's navigator for the deliveries. He's smaller than Sway Sway, but brings just as much, if not more, energy to every situation. Throughout their goofball deliveries, they often have to come up with ways to fix, solve, or get past problems, majority caused because of them, by leveling up and or transforming themselves in order to do so. Why? 
be because they they can, I guess. The main concept is simple, as the outliers within any given episode are what draw you in. There is a supporting cast of interesting characters as well, from their pet frog Jelly, who doesn't speak outside of saying ribbit, but is voiced by Alexander Polinsky. The bread maker himself, in which the two seek advice or assistance from, voiced by Fred Tatasher, is kinda like a genie, as he appears after his magical toaster is rubbed. When the two need some work done on their van, Keta, a swan who runs her own mechanic shop, is there for them, voiced by Carrie Walgren. Because of their constant mayhem and less than satisfactory flying, or dr driving, whatever you call it, Officer Rambambu, voiced by Audrey Wazalewski, is a yellow-toed chief officer of the Tad Police. And as the one who teaches driving class, you can only imagine how quickly they get on her nerves. And as far as any notable, shady characters or considered bad guys, S. Scott Bullock voiced T. Mitty, an owl who, an owl who, shut up! An owl who, while having a low patience tolerance to these two, is their number one customer. There's Mr. Pumpers, voiced by Michael Leon Woolley. He's a stork who performs a lot of get-rich-quick schemes that pretty much work out for him every time. He also owns the Pumpers Diner, a sky-floating restaurant. And then there is Unski the Great, voiced by Norma the Nor- I am so sorry. Nolan North. I didn't mean to say that, but I, I'm just gonna leave it in. He's a Viking beaver who talks in the third person. Person, steals anything that he wants to steal and is generally a menace to Pangea. Man, that is just such a good name. I think the most unique thing about this show is the way in which episodes are made. Traditionally, you have the ideas, storyboards, and everything leading up to production being worked on first and foremost. Here, however, the music takes center stage as the episodes are built upon the music first, specifically the score of the show by Tommy Sika, a friend of Gary's from a band they used to play in together. Before any animation, the score of the show would be recorded first, this being a guiding line that drives the events of the show at a certain beat-by-beat -beat rate faster than most. Downtime is rarely a thing found within this show. It's filled with constant shenanigans, bits, action, and conversations that fly by faster than the van. This constant beat-throughout-the-show idea seemed to work out as during test screenings with kids, they would quote-unquote bounce to the rhythm of the show developed. Couple this with the look of the show being styled more cartoony to fit an aesthetic of retro video games with pixelated-esque backgrounds as well as the shadows of the characters themselves. For me, I think the show is pretty alright. I know that the random equals funny humor gets on a lot of people's nerves making something like this easier to tune off. And sure, it does get that way quite a bit, but I do find it fascinating about the score driving the show's flow and which made the experience of watching the show way more enjoyable and easier to sit through for me. It didn't do anything too special to stand out from other shows around the time, but it had some truly unique qualities that did make it more its own. I like how bright and vivid it is, maybe just not how childish it is. Most different types of humor I can find enjoyment in, whether it's deemed toilet humor or gross-out humor or whatever. If a comedy, cartoon or not, can get a singular chuckle out of me or contain my interest, then I don't personally see any major failure in it. The story of how this show came to be is inspiring, and I'm glad that two people with an idea were able to successfully get their short scene and picked up for a full show, especially when it seemed like such an incredibly far long shot. April 5th, 2015, the second season of Breadwinners would premiere on Nickelodeon, this time to less viewership and less support for the show. The negative critic reviews surely didn't help, and overall, the beginning of the end for the show was clear. Winners up next. Nine episodes. That's how many episodes came out between April and December of 2015. Sure, you can consider that to be half the season, roughly, for a mid-season break. But it was odd. Because of the spacing between episodes being far apart, this seemed a bit more calculated from Nickelodeon, as the initial faith they seemed to have in the show was no longer there, essentially self-sabotaging their own show. The viewership dropping and the bad reviews had them begin to shove the show aside, but more 
importantly, this can also be due to the fact that at this point for the network, they were looking for the next SpongeBob, throwing money at so many new ideas for a chance to see if that was it and pushing them aside if it didn't immediately have the impact they thought it would. These other shows like Breadwinners we will sure cover soon, but specifically for this show, it was given a sentence that most mid 2000s shows faced, the Nicktoon Network curse. Returning for the rest of season two in April of 2016 and running the final 11 episodes until September of that year. However, it was only now on the Nicktoon Network channel, notorious as the graveyard for shows that the main Nickelodeon channel pushed away for them to quietly end their run. While there is a lot of stuff that the Nicktoons Network is a good thing for, it's not always all bad. It's just been known mainly for this reason, thus getting deemed the place non-SpongeBob shows go to die. Even though the show would come to an end with the final episode feeling just like any other episode, Nicktoons kept the show alive for reruns up until December of 2020, where now the whole show resides on Paramount+. Plus. The only physical release of the show was on a season one DVD set, but nothing for season two. As quickly as the show was picked up on a whim, it was gone just as fast and given a fate all too familiar to so many other Nickelodeon cartoons. Both creators went on to do other things with their career though, with Gary going on to be an animator on the Netflix show The Midnight Gospel, and Steve went on to work on Teen Titans Go. The sadder and more sinister aspect of all of this though, isn't the forcing of the show onto a side network channel, but the ownership of the IP. Legally, Nickelodeon purchases the IP and decides what happens with it. That's a common practice. But at one point, Viacom used their powers of owning the IP to copyright claim the original short that was made and posted on YouTube, claiming it all is their own. So I guess the real breadwinner here at the end of the day was Viacom. But what do you guys think about this show? I've heard some pretty positive things in my comment section about it and I can see why it was enjoyed and also why it may not have been for everybody. But tell me your opinions on the show in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this or I'll destroy this Spyro plush with my bare hands. Follow me on Twitter and I'll be back with another video soon. But until then, later.